All right. Today, let's talk about lithium. Um, lithium is a element that you hear about a lot these days. So we're going to be talking about uh, energy here um, and the move away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. That's on everybody's mind these days. And we, we've, we've talked about geothermal energy. We haven't talked about solar photovoltaics. Uh, but and wind turbines are another thing. Um, but um, lithium feeds into this transition to renewable energy. So um, solar photovoltaics are basically taking sunlight directly and converting that into uh, electrical energy by taking the photons from the sun and kicking out electrons that then um, become part of an electrical circuit. And this is growing very, very rapidly. There seems great potential for this in uh, parts of Latin America. The Atacama comes to mind. But um, we're not going to talk so much about this. Wind turbines are also very powerful. And um, they're getting more powerful with time as this technology advances. And there may be places in Latin America where wind energy may be an important part of their future. Now, just to give you an idea of, of the kinds of combinations of energy that w modern society needs to have in order to provide, say, all of the electricity that Texas needs for air conditioning in the summertime, um, let's compare where two states, U.S. states, Texas and California, get their electrical energy. So here's Texas over here, and here's um, California over here. So Texas is almost half generated by natural gas. And what's happened in Texas is that wind energy is becoming increasingly important to the point that um, it's about the same amount as uh, electrical generation by uh, coal. In California, it's um, a bit different, but you know, natural gas is almost 60% of their uh, electricity generation. Hydroelectricity, because there's lots of mountains and rivers, is a good portion. Geothermal energy, um, as we heard about before, is important in, in California. And wind is also important, but not quite as important as solar, and right now, California is leading the nation in solar energy, and Texas is um, not anywhere close to that. But that's going to be changing uh, soon. Now, one of the exciting things that's happened in this energy transition is that, for the first time, the United States um, renewable energy consumption surpassed coal for the first time in over 130 years. So this is going back to the beginning of the country pretty much to today. And what you can see is that coal was a very important part of the nation's uh, energy supply, and especially electrical energy. And it has, in the last few years, has dropped off precipitously at the same time that renewables have grown. That's a very exciting uh, crossover point. OK, now the reality is the sun doesn't shine all the time, and the wind doesn't blow all the time. In order to take advantage of renewable energy like solar and wind energy, we need a way to be able to store energy in batteries. And in fact, the future of wind and solar energy depends on advances in, in battery technology. At present, the best batteries use a lot of lithium. And in addition, electrical vehicles, they need powerful batteries. They need batteries that can store as much energy as possible for their weight. Um, and what you can see is that the electrical vehicles now, this is growing very rapidly from almost nothing in 2015 to here we are in 2024, around there. But it's expected to grow much, much more as time goes on. And we need to be able to power these. And right now it looks like lithium-ion batteries are the way to go. Next slide. All right, so we're going to need a bigger boat. So those of you that have seen JAWS know that reference. Uh, Jaws 1975, maybe a little bit before some of your time. But um, basically, when they saw the shark, they were going, we need a bigger boat. And uh, 
for, and for our purposes, what that means is we're going to need a lot more lithium for all of the new batteries that the, the energy transition is going to require. Let's talk about batteries. So the first battery was described by Alexander Volta in 1800. So we've known that you could store electricity for quite some time. And what a battery is, is something that just stores electrical energy. So th there's two kinds of batteries that we could talk about, primary cells and secondary cells. And uh, we know these both because we use them both. Batteries designed for a si single discharge cycle, that is you buy them, you use them, you throw them away, those are primary cells. And we're not going to spend any more time on these. We're not going to swap out our batteries on our, pre on our Teslas uh, whenever they uh, run out. We want something that we can recharge. And rechargeable batteries are called secondary cells. And that's what we're going to need more of and more powerful ones of for the energy transition. All right, so what is a battery? So a battery is something that has a fixed amount of a chemical that will produce a flow of electrons. That should be an F there, obviously. If there's a conductive path is connected to its terminal. So here we have a schematic of a battery. And we have a, a, a positive and a negative. And the electrons go from the negative anode to the positive anode. And that sets up a flow of electrons. And that can be used to power a load, which could be a light bulb or a car or just about anything. And this same cartoon is represented by an electronic schematic this way. Not that you have to know that. So basically, the oxidation or the loss of an electron of the electrolyte happens at the anode. And the reduction and the gain of electron happens at the cathode. And if we've got electrons moving, we've got electricity. So the most commonly known secondary cells are lead-acid batteries. Uh, most of you have, have had experience with them and, and how they eventually uh, go bad and have to be replaced. And they're not too expensive, you know. And, but this is a good example of a charging cycle of a secondary battery. So here we've got... Uh, uh, a sort of a car battery. It's a porous sponge lead plates make up the anode. Lead dioxide uh, plates make up the cathode. And then it's separated by uh, a porous membrane in which has a sulfuric acid in there, H2SO4. And that electrolyte contains both hydrogen ions and sulfate ions. And the reaction goes like this. And we can go through all of the, the reactions to show you how we get electrons to make electricity. So basically, the lead in the metal is converted to lead sulfate um, by the um, sulfuric acid. And that happens at the anode. And it also releases two electrons, which make an electrical current. And then at the cathode, the lead um, dioxide is converted into solid lead sulfate. So lead oxide plus four uh, hydrogens from the acid plus a sulfate ion goes back and makes uh, lead sulfate. So the total reaction is, is shown here. You don't need to memorize this for the test. But the left to right indicates the, bat the battery is discharging. So this way is, is, is releasing electrons and um, providing electricity, and right to left, the, the battery is recharging, you know. Now, the advantage of the lead-acid battery is they're low cost, and they have a pretty high power density. But the disadvantages are a relatively short life cycle and um, a relatively low uh, power density. It's, it's, not, it's not useful for commercial and large-scale energy management applications like we're going to need for the um, 21st, 22nd century energy transition. All right, so here's how we compare uh, different battery types. This is a, a graph showing um, all the different types of common um, batteries. So here's the lead-acid battery down here. 
Here's the lithium ion battery over here. And there's some other ones, nickel cadmium, um, other things. Now on this, di on this axis, we're plotting the number of watts that can be stored per kilogram of battery. So as you go higher up, you've got more storage. And on this axis, we've got the specific energy, the number of hours of watts per kilogram. So that, that means you can, you can take a lot more energy out of it if it's farther to the right. So lead acid, you can't take too much energy out of it. Lithium ion batteries, you can. Almost 10 times as much as a lead acid battery. Now, you, we have to keep in mind that battery uh, research and development is changing rapidly, and new types of batteries are constantly in, entering the market. And so we can't really say what the future battery will be. Their lithium may go away. Uh, some other thing may come in and replace it. But right now, it looks like uh, it is the dominant, most useful uh, battery for the, the kinds of things that the energy transition is going to require. Okay, let's, uh, let's watch a, an eight-minute video about the, the business of batteries. I hope you like it. Take a minute and think about how many things you've used today that need a battery. We're surrounded by them. The one in your car represents a $53 billion market. The kind in your phone, $23 billion. Plus, in under 10 years, those markets are expected to grow to $81 and $93 billion, respectively. But how much do you know about how batteries actually work? A battery is a device inside of which a chemical reaction happens that generates electricity. It's an electrochemical device, and for it to work, you need two different metals and a substance called an electrolyte. A standard AA battery, for example, uses zinc and manganese dioxide. This all started in 1799, when an Italian scientist named Alessandro Volta invented what would become known as the voltaic pile, the first modern battery. The initial invention by Volta was uh, basically a stack of coins, uh, silver and zinc, separated by cardboard soaked in brine. It would uh, deliver electric current on demand. And that's the way things were for about 60 years. And already during that time, within 10 years of the publication of Volta's invention, uh, people were pulling it out into, the, uh, into commerce. So the metals Volta used were zinc and silver, and the electrolyte was just salt water. And you'll notice that as we talk about later battery tech, the innovations happen when scientists figure out how to swap out one of those two things, the metals or the electrolyte. Things changed again in 1831, when a British scientist named Michael Faraday invented the dynamo, a generator, and we were finally able to get electricity on demand. When electricity generation was invented as a result of the, the dynamo, then people started to think about rechargeable batteries, and that was when the lead acid battery was first uh, rolled out. Most of us are familiar with car batteries, so these are lead acid battery. These are very low in energy density, but operate for about a decade. They're extremely robust, but they're very large. And then after World War II, nickel cadmium batteries showed up and were used to power things like early camera flashes. After that, nickel metal hydride batteries came onto the scene and improved on nickel cadmium batteries in most every way. Both of these batteries are still used in certain things today and were at one point both used in electric vehicles. But then in 1991, Sony introduced the first commercial lithium ion battery. And once again, everything changed. Sony was able to produce a, the lithium ion battery we know today. This technology allowed another doubling of energy density and allowed for now these small consumer devices to be on a scale that one can hold and put in your pocket. Today's lithium ion battery has enabled the revolution of electric cars. They have enabled the revolution of consumer electronics like laptops and cell phones. Lithium ion is, is here to stay for the foreseeable future. It's a proven technology. It's the, the best we've got, and it's the right technology for mobile handheld devices, whether it's uh, phones and, and computers, tablets, and so on. Lithium ion batteries have had a transformative effect on electronics, and the industry has exploded. The lithium ion battery market was worth $23 billion in 2016, but that's expected to jump to $93 billion by 2025. 
Electric cars are a huge reason why. Tesla, for example, is betting big on lithium ion. Its cars use battery packs made up from thousands of lithium ion battery cells. Individually, they look like slightly larger AA batteries, but together they generate enough power to move a car. These cells are made by Panasonic for Tesla at its massive Gigafactory 1 battery factory outside Reno, Nevada. The factory works around the clock and cranks out about two of these huge battery packs every minute. The battery remains the costliest part of the vehicle, so it's really, really important that we improve our efficiency and the design so that we make them more affordable. The more electric vehicles out there, the better. Any new battery technology has to compete with lithium-ion batteries if the battery technology is to be viable for the huge market of electric vehicles. Unfortunately, it is very challenging to design a battery that can decrease in cost faster than the lithium-ion battery, and this is largely being the reason why lithium-ion battery is and will be the dominating technology for electric vehicles in the next 10 to 20 years. But nonetheless, this current generation of lithium-ion batteries is not the end of the road for battery tech. We've been working on lithium ion per se since the, uh, since the early 90s, but that has evolved from cobalt oxide to nickel oxide to manganese oxide to now we have some combination of all three metals to give sort of the best battery we know, we know of today. And while American scientists have invented their fair share of battery technology, lately other countries like South Korea, China, and Japan have been leaders in improving batteries, continuously making them more powerful and more efficient. With millions upon millions of battery-powered devices being produced, where we get the elements that go into them and what happens to them at their end of life are both big concerns. Elements like cobalt, for example, a known conflict mineral, are currently needed to produce most lithium-ion batteries. A battery is a closed device. It doesn't output any carbon dioxide. It doesn't release any harmful chemicals. So in that sense, it is very environmental friendly. However, that is not a complete view of a battery life cycle. And we're talking about many billions of batteries that are now reaching their end of life. Researchers are working on two main solutions, how to best recycle the component materials and how these batteries can be reused in other applications. One of the other biggest things that material scientists are working on right now is developing large scale energy storage technologies. It's these types of huge batteries that are gonna link intermittent renewables like solar or wind power with the grid. I think that people don't realize that the grid operates such that the electricity powering this conversation was generated just moments ago. It's all just in time. The grid is the world's largest supply chain with zero inventory. If, for example, it's a beautiful sunny day and we've got a super abundance of electricity, we can't use it. Supply must be in balance with demand everywhere at all times. So batteries, it's everything. The takeaway here is that if we had really, really big battery systems that could store renewable energy and then inject that energy into the grid when and where we want them to, it could transform the world's electricity systems for the better. Tesla's Powerwall does this at the home level, but the hope is to do it on a city level. Tesla is one of the companies working on that too, though, and last year it opened the world's largest lithium-ion battery facility on a wind farm in Australia. But right now, systems like this are few and far between. To be able to store the electricity generated by wind and solar, you need a technology that is perhaps 10 or 20 times less expensive than today's lithium-ion battery technology. So you don't have to worry about uh, temperature of operation because it's not going to be put on your lap or next to your face. You don't have to worry about energy density because you're not going to be moving it. What you really care about is safety, a service lifetime. And if you can give me something that's big, cheap, safe, then I don't care about things like watt hours per kilogram. And there are a number of uh, contenders out there but the future is not going to be a mirror of the past. If we want to get 5x better, we've got to do something that's radically different from everything that's been done up until now. And um, I'm really excited about that. Okay, I, I hope you enjoyed that video and learned a lot. Let's talk more about the lithium ion battery itself. So lithium ion batteries use lithium compounds and are secondary batteries, as we said. They have three primary components, like all batteries, the anode, the cathode, 
and the electrolyte. So here's the cathode, here's the anode, and in here is the electrolyte. Um, the cathode is normally a lithium cobalt oxide or a lithium manganese oxide. The anode is normally layered uh, graphitic carbon. And the, the electrolyte is a lithium salt, could be lithium phosphorus uh, hexafluoride or boron um, tetrafluoride or, or lithium um, chlorate, perchlorate in some kind of an organic solvent. And the lithium ion, the positive lithium ions move from the anode to the cathode during the discharge. Okay? So far, so good. All right, so um, these vehicles, like the Tesla, um, use a lot of lithium. And they are just racks of them here. This is a module of these individual batteries, which are shown over here. And there are multiple modules in the vehicle to store the power. All right, what about lithium? So lithium is an element. It is on the periodic table right there under hydrogen. It's a relatively light element. The only elements that are lighter than it are hydrogen and helium. Um, it's element three. It's an alkali metal which means it gives up its electron easily. So um, lithium goes to um, positively charged lithium, and these form ionic bonds and salts. Very easy to move around. All right, now one of the challenges is that lithium is relatively uncommon. Now this is a plot of the abundance of the elements in the Earth. And in general, the, the, you'll see this range is tremendous. This is going from one, one part per million to one to a billion. So going from here, you know, oxygen, which is about 10 to the seventh, or um, 10 million, down to iridium, which is one part in 10,000 is a huge range. And you see this overall decrease from abundant light elements to rare heavy elements. But lithium is an exception because lithium is relatively rare. And that's got to do with the way the elements were produced in, in um, stellar processes. We don't have time to go into this. But it's not a very abundant element on the Earth. So we have to find some way to concentrate it in order to make it economic to exploit it. So let's watch a, a 10 minute uh, video. I hope you like it. Hi, I'm Allie Sealander with UTD GeoNews, and today I want to talk to you about lithium and how it's becoming increasingly important to our future. In September of 2020, the governor of California announced that the state would show its commitment to addressing global climate change by banning the sale of new gasoline-powered cars and trucks by 2035. We are marking a new course. Uh, we are setting a new marker. Firm goal that by 2035, in the next 15 years, we will eliminate in the state of California the sales of internal combustion engines. In January of 2021, President Biden and his new administration has said that they were going to work to completely replace the entire fleet of nearly 650,000 government vehicles with electric ones. And a few days after that, General Motors made an announcement and said that they were going to completely phase out all of their gas and diesel engines by 2035 in favor of all electric vehicles. But what do these announcements have to do with lithium? Well, an essential component of electric vehicles is the lithium ion battery. And since replacing gasoline powered cars with battery powered ones would help reduce the use of fossil fuels, lithium has now become an essential component to reducing global warming. The lithium ion batteries that power electric vehicles are like those that power your laptop or phone, but are scaled up to handle the power demand of an entire vehicle. The efficiency and recharging capability of these batteries has made them a critical part of electric vehicles. Even though commercial lithium-ion batteries have been around since the 1990s, 
They are becoming more important every year. In the year 2000, the production of rechargeable batteries consumed only about 5% of the world's production of lithium. The rest was used in things like ceramics, greases, and a bunch of other things. But by 2020, over half went into batteries. This new demand for lithium is closely tied to the electric vehicle market. To put it in perspective, an electric car with an 80 kilowatt hour battery contains about 15 kilograms of lithium. That's about the same weight as three gallons of milk. In 2016, the world used 200,000 tons of lithium, and this is expected to increase five-fold to well over a million tons by 2030. Demand is exploding. The California Initiative, Biden's plan, and announcements like General Motors are following a trend that's seeing more and more electric vehicles on the road. And more electric vehicles means we're gonna need a lot more lithium. What is lithium anyway? Well, it's an alkali metal, like sodium or potassium. It is the third lightest element behind hydrogen and helium. Metallic lithium is so light it floats on water. Like any metal, it's an excellent conductor of heat as well as electricity. But you'll never see lithium in its elemental form in nature. Like other alkali metals, lithium bonds with elements in rock-forming minerals. It can be found in igneous rocks and clays, or can be dissolved in brines and seawater. Of these, it's the lithium found in igneous rocks and continental brines that are the most economically extractable. Let's start with igneous rocks. Rocks are made up of minerals. There are thousands of minerals, but just 124 contain lithium, and only a handful of these contain enough to be worth mining. The most important is the mineral spodumene, with lithium oxide making up between 6 and 9% of the mineral's weight. So the more spodumene you have, the more lithium that's available. This is an enormous crystal of spodumene found in Plumbago Mountain, Maine. Minerals in igneous rocks come in a wide range of sizes, but when they are large, geologists call the rock a pegmatite. There are lots of pegmatites all over the world, but only a few contain lithium-rich minerals. Right now, most of our global production of lithium comes from pegmatite mines in Australia. But Australia doesn't have the most lithium, far from it. And in fact, most of our lithium resources don't even come from pegmatites. 66% of global lithium resources can be found in continental brine deposits. So what is a brine? Well, a brine is water with a high concentration of dissolved salts. The most common salt is sodium chloride, but there are others like potassium chloride and lithium carbonate. Seawater is about 3.5% dissolved salts. Anything saltier than that, and it's considered a brine. The brines that are mined for lithium range from about 6% to 84% dissolved salts. To make lithium brines, you need an arid basin, a depression in the land in an area with more evaporation than precipitation. Water flowing over surrounding highlands leaches lithium out of the rocks and carries dissolved lithium into the basin. A brine collects in the sediments below the surface of the basin where the lithium content becomes increasingly concentrated with time. These sorts of conditions can be found in and around the Atacama Desert, specifically the area dubbed the Lithium Triangle. That includes parts of Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. This is one of the driest places on Earth, and beneath the salt flats, or salars, that are scattered around the area lie the lithium-enriched brines. To get the lithium, holes are drilled into the ground and the salty solution is pumped to the surface. The brines are evaporated in ponds until all that's left are the salts, including the lithium. These operations are easier and cheaper to run than hard rock mining, and because of the absolute abundance of lithium resources here, it makes sense that this method of lithium extraction has become increasingly important. This is how we extract lithium. So I guess the next question is, when should we expect to run out of it? Will we have enough lithium to power our greener battery powered future? To answer this, we need to know how much lithium we expect to use. This is difficult to predict. One projection we found tied lithium ion battery demand to future global GDP growth. 
it made a handful of other reasonable assumptions about our future lithium use, and it made a forecast of future use from 2010 to 2100. It projected the demand for lithium to be about 20 million tons. That's about the same weight as 4 billion gallons of milk. As for how much we have, well, every year the U.S. Geological Survey publishes what is called the Mineral Commodity Summary. That includes statistics and information on lithium. In 2020, this estimated global lithium resources to be around 80 million tons. Comparing this with the projection of just 20 million tons needed to sustain our demand until 2100, it seems like we'll have enough. At the very least, we have a good start to beat the growing demand for lithium. But making long-term predictions, especially those related to rapidly evolving technologies, is a fool's game. Technology shifts, mineral prices vary, recycling capabilities improve, and even global pandemics are all variables that can affect lithium supply and demand in ways that cannot be predicted. The increasing desire for electric vehicles is currently fueling demand for lithium. But what if other applications turn up and prove to be just as sought after? Products like Tesla's Powerwall and Powerpack use lithium-ion batteries to store energy for homes and for commercial use. Tesla announced these in 2015, a few years after the 20 million ton projection was published. We just don't know if these and other new uses of lithium will fuel demand as fast as they do for electric cars, but they might. Or what if new battery technology emerges that uses much less lithium or even no lithium at all? In fast changing situations like these, it's useful to recall the old adage, all models are wrong, but some are useful. It's important to note that even though lithium mining is a vital part of our efforts to put less CO2 in the atmosphere, it still harms the environment in other ways. To produce one ton of lithium, you need to mine 250 tons of spodumene. Extracting the same amount of lithium from a brine requires the use of 500,000 gallons of water. These operations divert land and water that can be used for other things, and also cause pollution that can and have hurt nearby communities. So we have enough lithium to get us through the next few decades as we move towards a greener future, but we're less confident about what happens after that. To take Nirvana's song Lithium completely out of context, I'm not sure, I'm so excited, I can't wait to meet you there. See you next time. Hope you enjoyed that video. All right, now in any kind of uh, investment where you're trying to figure out, are we gonna mine this or not? Or are we gonna start this business or not? It's the price of what, you can, of, of what you're selling determines an awful lot. So for example, lithium. So this is a price of lithium from 2002 we're in 2022, we're not quite there, but this is um, for uh, the um, lithium per pound, okay? So going from zero to $40, it was basically a dollar or so a pound back 20 years ago, and it's up to $15 a pound now. Now with increased demand, the expectation is that the price of lithium will continue to rise, you know, whether it's gonna rise like this or whether it's gonna rise like that, depends on a lot of things you can't predict. That's the realm of economics and investment. Um, that's not what this class is about, but as something becomes more valuable, more and more people will try and find ways to extract it and sell it on the market. And that's where we are today with lithium. With, with the um, energy transition and the recognition that lithium ion batteries are by far the best battery, the demand for lithium is growing. All right, where do we get lithium from? Well, here's where we are as of 2020. And um, 
Australia, Chile, China, and Argentina. Thousands of tons of lithium mined. So Australia is the largest producer of lithium, and then it's followed distantly by Chile, China, and Argentina. And most of the world's lithium production in 2019 came from six hard rock operations in Australia. So basically, they're um, finding certain kinds of granites and uh, mining them. And then in, in Argentina and, Chi and Chile, they are doing something different. They are extracting brines out of the ground. Much easier um, to extract the lithium than mining hard rocks. All right, now that takes us to the Lithium Triangle of Latin America. And the Lithium Triangle of Latin America is defined by the SLARs of Northwest Argentina, Southwest Bolivia, and Northern Chile. You rem remember our old friend, the Atacama Desert, or the city of Antofagasta? This region shows up as an interesting place in Latin America again. All right, what is a salar? A salar is a salt-encrusted depression formed at, on the site of an evaporated lake. Sometimes we use the word playa for things like this, but, um, you know, it varies. It can be wet. You know, here you've got a nice lake. It's obviously not very deep, or they wouldn't be driving their car out on it. And then it dries. And so that wet-dry cycle um, ends up producing a lot of salt. This is the Salar de Uyuni, and uh, you see many different e examples of that in the, lith in the lithium triangle. All right, now let's look down at these on, uh, from space. This is the largest Salar in the world, is Salar de Uyuni, is in the Altiplano of Bolivia. This is about the same size as the big island of Hawaii quite a big, big salar. All right, here's another view from space. Um, this was taken from the International Space Station looking southeast across South America. So this is the Atlantic Ocean over here. And then this is Argentina. And then this is... Um, sort of that lithium triangle area. And you can see all of these salars. You know, all of these little white things are salars, different sizes. Um, and the Salar de uh, Arizaro here is the, is the largest of the salars. Okay? All right, so how do we get lithium in these salars? So basically, what happens is these basins are basically filled up with sediments. And then, uh, in addition, whenever it rains and water flows in here, it brings lithium from these older rocks or from volcanoes or from windblown dust. And that um, is dissolved and infiltrates into the subsurface. The lake. The lake dries up and goes away, but underground, um, there's still um, brine. So what do we mean when we say brine? So brine is basically a high concentration of salt in water. So in specifically, it, it's saltier than seawater. So here we've got a scale of uh, parts per thousand salt dissolved in water. And here, we, this, we like our drinking water down here. Seawater is about 30 parts per thousand. And brine is anything that's, that's more concentrated than that. Brines can contain up to 26% dissolved salts. Seawater is, as we said, only 3.5% salts. All right, so... Here we see another view of lithium sources and getting into salars. So, you know, here's the salar here in yellow. Here is a, a lake. It's evaporating in the sunlight. And whenever it rains and 
Um, the rocks shed uh, some of their weathered material into the, the, the water. That's going to flow to the uh, salar and either s and sink into the ground or evaporate and sink into the ground. But in any case, the lithium is coming from the surrounding regions and being concentrated in the salar. Now here's an, a way that um, earth scientists look at salars as they're trying to figure out how do we get, where's the best place to drill and get, um, get the rich brine. So here we're looking at uh, a geophysical profile. It's actually looking at the resistivity, the electrical resistivity. It doesn't really matter. Um, but, but basically, these colors correspond to different resistivities. Um, things down here that are highly resistive are basically hard rocks. And things up in here in the basin are the regions where there are briny solutions and brines are quite conductive, and so you can see, you know, this is a very conductive region. Maybe the brine isn't there. Here's another one. And so we can, you can put uh, drill holes down into it and pump the brine out. Um, but that's the way that people make decisions about whether a region is, is worth trying to extract the brine out or not. Okay, once you get the brine out, what do you do with it? Well, here is the, um, the brine from, from the salar, the saline aquifer. You pump it out. You pump it into a, a drying pond. Let the sodium uh, mix out. Take some of that evaporated brine and, and get other things out of it. And it's a series of ponds until the last thing that is uh, left in the brine pond is the lithium. And then you take that out, process it further, and make the lithium carbonate that is sold on the market. All right, here's a view of one of these plants. So what you can see here is a salar, and then a number of evaporating plants. You can't really see the pumps, but they're not far away. But basically, um, you're looking at the color variations are telling you different concentrations of salt in the, in the water. So you're, you're sort of going this way. The lighter blue ponds have the highest concentrations of lithium. All right, now let's, we're not gonna talk, we, we talked about lithium production. Australia is clearly far and away the leader, uh, China in second place. Now we're talking about resources. How much could we extract if um, if it was possible. And in this situation, you can see a very different picture. Australia has got about 6 million uh, tons of, uh, of, of lithium, and China has a little bit less. But look at these three countries. Bolivia, 21 million. Argentina, 17 million. Chile, 9 million. These countries are critical um, for the energy transition. If we're going to be able to meet the lithium demand, it's going to be because these countries and others, but especially these countries, were able to invest, allow invest, massive investment in um, lithium extraction. That is the key challenge. Okay, so now let's look at the South American lithium triangle again. Remember, we're in, in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile. Uh, Argentina already produces about 12% of the world's lithium and it wants to attract more mineral explorers and investors. Um, in Chile, this Atacama Salar contains about 27% of the world's lithium reserves and today uh, provides about 30% of the world's lithium carbonate. So they are the second and fourth largest lithium producers, respectively. Bolivia holds the largest reserves, not yet commercially exploited. And so um, this sets up a very interesting situation. Now remember, Latin America has been a storehouse of mineral wealth that's been taken advantage of by the West 
for 500 years. And there's certain resistance uh, to this happening again with lithium. At the same time, these countries understand that their economies need the jobs, need the investment, need the tax revenue that comes. And so there's a very interesting political um, discussion about how to move forward with lithium in this region. All right, so one of the most interesting happened in Bolivia. As, as you recall, Bolivia's got lots of lithium, none of it's being exploited right now. So recently, in both Chile and Bolivia, there were violent anti-government demonstrations that uh, threatened lithium investments. Um, in Chile, there were massive protests over economic inequality, and this temporarily blocked access to lithium operations. And um, the investors who had thought that Chile was a place where they could invest and their investment would be not taken away from them, not nationalized, um, they were surprised. In Bolivia, the clashes between protesters and police left more than 30 dead and led to the resignation of longtime President Evo Morales um, in November 2019. Um, he, he had been accused of rigging the elections, but there was also concern about a contract that Morales signed with a German lithium company. And people in the areas that were producing the lithium wanted a higher uh, percentage of, of the uh, income stream. Um, anyway, the, the, this contract was canceled, but the political uncertainty remains. And this makes it very difficult for investors to do anything in terms of investing in developing Bolivia's uh, lithium industry. More, more recently, in June of 2022, Bolivia's government has been moving to, to um, give a concession, a contract, to one or more companies who would help them develop their lithium uh, resources. Um, they haven't named that company yet, they're, they haven't even made it clear whether there's going to be one or more companies involved. Um, but the, it, it's clear that the government recognized the need to move forward, at the same time acknowledging the concerns of uh, many Bolivians. They need to do this because in spite of the fact that it's the most, it's got the biggest uh, lithium resource on Earth, they haven't been able to develop any commercial lithium production. Um, and so uh, Bolivia will continue to meet steep challenges to meet its target of producing lithium ion batteries. They want to they produce batteries in the country of Bolivia itself by 2025. All right, now Argentina is a significantly different story. So um, in May of 2022, Bloomberg told this story about uh, 400 mining executives and government officials gathering to toast Argentina's natural resource riches amid the kind of corporate giddiness not seen since Argentina first tried to develop its shale oil resources a decade ago. And the attraction is lithium. Um, people see that there's a, a short, likely shortage of the rare metal. Um, and Chinese and U.S. companies are, in, are engaging in bidding wars for access to the lithium resources of Argentina. Um, companies like Rio Tinto and Zijin Mining Group are pouring more than a billion dollars into the country. Um, and this investment is, is critical because um, Australia and Chile's dominance um, is, is likely to fade. And, and Argentina and, and certainly Bolivia need to increase. Um, and so Bank of America um, uh, official said that if Argentina doesn't come through, it will be almost impossible for the lithium market to stay well provided, well supplied. So um, investors and governments and people are, are jockeying to figure out what's the best way to move forward with lithium in the lithium triangle. 
In addition, there are real environmental concerns for growing the lithium industry in South America. Um, there are social and environmental demands that have to be uh, met. So lo some lithium projects are already encountering domestic hostility because they use water. And this, where these salars are, water is scarce. So uh, the farmers are saying, wait, you're, that's water that we need. Um, you can't use it. And, and that's a, a source of tension. And then uh, indigenous communities and environmental groups in uh, northwest Argentina have been protesting lithium extraction, demanding more information on the distribution of the lithium royalties, right, who's getting rich, and on to better understand the possible negative impacts on water supplies. And in Chile, a court upheld an appeal by the indigenous people living close to the Atacama Desert brine operations who argued that the remediation plan was insufficient to address environmental impacts, including to the region's flamingo co colonies. So, um, lots going on. It's, it's a different story than it was when the Spanish started ex um, using the, the Mita system to get silver out. But still, many of the same themes that we've seen in terms of the silver uh, mining, um, the copper mining, the oil uh, production are now being replayed, hopefully with uh, some better results um, for lithium, which is so important to our future. So um, thank you. Next time we'll be talking about Latin American earthquakes. Have a good one.